Coming up on Need to Know, divided is one of the single most common words used to describe the state of our country after this year's election. But the leader of one of America's oldest religious denominations visits Rochester with a unifying charge for residents. That's next. Also on the show, the culmination of nearly 600 days of local, state, and presidential campaigning has area residents feeling a mix of emotions. How people on both sides of the political aisle feel as we move past election 2016. And in the name of inclusion, a local dance company offers sensory-friendly performances. The story behind these special productions and who benefits just ahead. Stay with us. Need to Know starts right now. was founded with a vision for freedom, a vision that has required repeated challenges in order to move toward true liberty for all the people of this land. Those are the words of the Most Reverend Michael Curry. The 27th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church was in Rochester this week to talk racial justice and reconciliation. The purpose for his visit and his message comes at a time when many say our country appears more divided on racial, gender, and socioeconomic lines than they realized. I sat down with the first African-American bishop of one of the oldest Christian denominations in America to talk social challenges for the church and our community. He also shared his strategy for better days ahead. Take a look. It was one year ago when you were installed as the 27th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. This is a denomination with more than 7,000 churches around the world. And what people may not know is that a large number of U.S. presidents are of the Episcopal faith, including George Washington, George H.W. Bush. For people unfamiliar with this denomination, how would you explain it and how does it fit into the American church community? Well, if you think about the Episcopal Church, aside from some of the presidents, um, people probably know the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. That's the cathedral where I actually have a seat of the presiding bishop, and the Bishop of Washington is actually at the National Cathedral. So that whenever there are national gatherings, remember after 9-11, the president, and we have national prayer services. It's sort of a church for national purposes. Well, that's an Episcopal Cathedral. Um, maybe another thing that might resonate. Anybody's ever seen the Queen of England, Her Majesty? Um, she's the head of the Church of England, so to speak, and um, the Episcopal Church is sort of the um, American version, if you will, of the Church of England, of the Anglican communion around the world. Um, if you've ever heard of Desmond Tutu, um, um, he's one of us. Um, um, he's in South <laughs> Africa, but we're in the U.S. So that those might be some familiar trappings. Um, if you will, but the Episcopal Church has been around a, a, a good while, um, and it's a, it's a church um, like many of our church traditions um, that that thinks of it, that is mainline um, in that respect. But I think what we're finding is the Episcopal Church is, is the kind of place that's seeking to be, you know, like the Bible says, like Jesus quoting the prophet says, a house of prayer for all people. And my hope and dream is that the Episcopal Church one day will be known as a church that really is a house of prayer for all people, and that becomes a model for America and the world as being a place for all people. Well, people should know that you're from upstate New York. I am. You grew up in Buffalo. Thank you received you. your first degree at Hobart and William Smith in Geneva, mm -hmm. and you have a deep history in the church. Considering that you were elected at a time of uh, transition for the Episcopal Church and also a time of challenges, do you feel as though you came on board, when you came on board, um, and this is a point with declining enrollment and some parishes have been closing, um, the church stepped out in support of same-sex marriage and there was some backlash for that. Do you feel as though you're carrying this, this heavy and challenging load or do you feel as though you've been given an opportunity? An opportunity. Describe it, it in what incredible ways? opportunity. One of the things that I've said and emphasized is that the church must move from thinking of itself as an institution and begin to think of itself again as a movement. That, that, that Jesus of Nazareth really didn't start an institution. Institutions can serve him, but, but he didn't start institutions. He started a movement. 
And the point of the movement was to change and transform the world following the way of Jesus from the nightmare it often is into the dream that God intends. And if we begin to think of ourselves as kind of the Jesus movement, if you will, a movement of people who are committed to living the kind of love that Jesus of Nazareth lived and really living that out and making a witness for that, then we will be able to navigate all sorts of cultural changes, all sorts of good days and bads because movements like, like that song, Old Man River, just keep rolling along. And that's where our energy, if you will, really comes from. So I see ourselves as having an opportunity to really be the Christian movement, the Jesus movement, that really is passionately committed to loving the way Jesus of Nazareth loved, to giving the way Jesus gives, to forgiving and doing justice and loving mercy. And if that's what we're about, let me tell you something, we got plenty of energy to do that. And you can navigate if you will, the vicissitudes of time and history and social changes and all of that kind of stuff because you're part of a deeper movement that just keeps moving along. And it's not our movement, it's God's. Racial justice and reconciliation, these are a priority right now for the Episcopal Church. And for some that, that may be interesting to hear considering that this is not the most racially diverse religious group, it's predominantly white. So why the focus on racial reconciliation and what does work in this arena look like for you? Two things. Um, I think I was elected in part because I articulated a vision of both evangelism, helping people find their way back to God, um, and racial reconciliation, helping them find them, their ways back to each other. Those two are intimately related. Um, and I think the mission of the church at its deepest root is to help folk find their way back to a relationship with the God who passionately loves us and wants us to live out of that love and therefore who passionately calls us to actually love and care for each other so that coming back to God and coming back to each other actually are two sides of the same coin, if you will. And so racial reconciliation and reconciliation over all the kinds of brokenness and divisions that are a part of our common life, that is the work of God, um, as the Jewish community says, tikkun olam, to heal the creation. That is part of the healing of creation. When, when I was elected, the shootings in Charleston had just happened um, the, the week before. Um, and, and so our conversations about racial reconciliation which had been going on for a while in the Episcopal Church, uh, took on a new urgency. Um, and, and I think we're seeing in our cultural time um, the need to do the hard work of real racial engagement and racial reconciliation and religious engagement and religious reconciliation and reconciliation across socioeconomic and cultural divides. Uh, Dr. King said it well a long time ago, uh, we will either learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we will perish together as fools. The choice is ours, chaos or community. We're living in a time where we have got to choose community. We have got to figure out how to live together because if we don't live together, if we don't swim together, we will sink together and we don't need to sink. And so I think the urgency of racial reconciliation, but reconciliation abroad across a whole spectrum of divisions, I think it is a social necessity, it is a global necessity, and in the end, it, it is a cosmic necessity because we must be reconciled with each other and reconciled with the air we breathe and the water we drink and the land we walk on, lest we destroy the very earth on which we live. And when that happens, none of us survives. Dr. King was right. We'll either live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. On that note, uh, the Episcopal Diocese of Rochester is hosting a special interfaith bipartisan Correct. event this right. week called From Nightmare to Dream, overturning the unholy trinity of poverty, racism, and violence. And Dr. King called those three issues the triple evils. Mm -hmm. How are poverty, racism, and violence connected? And, and why is it that this vicious cycle just seems to continue to manifest in our society? The reality, I mean, there's a, there's, I mean, there's some deeper roots to that, but 
But those three, poverty, racism, and violence, in our American experience, um, have been part and parcel um, of our journey. Now the, now the truth is, we have been able to chip away and improve. Um, I think one of the greatest dangers is to think or to fall for the deception that nothing can change. Things do change. They, they may not change in quantum leaps, but they can and do change. And the way they have historically changed is by people of faith and people of goodwill coming together, saying their prayers, putting their hand to the plow. You know, like that old song says, put your hand to the gospel plow. Putting their hands to the plow and doing the hard work of change. Soon after I was elected as presiding bishop, um, I, I went to Alabama um, and was there for, I uh, was at Selma and was able to preach at, at the Episcopal Church there in, in Selma, Alabama um, and across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Um, now I'm here to tell you that 50 years ago, I wouldn't have been preaching in the Episcopal Church in Selma, Alabama, much less as the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. But I was there, and I was there in a congregation that is relatively integrated. That wasn't there in Selma, Alabama um, in 1965. Um, and while we must continue to wait, struggle to maintain voting rights, and we're in the midst of struggle around that, the point of the matter is progress was made. Now, that, that may be incremental, but the point is, the greatest deception is to think that poverty and racism and violence have the last word and that they cannot be changed and defeated. They can be changed and defeated, but it's gonna take people who are bound and determined and who ain't gonna let nothing turn me around like that old song says, uh, who will keep going and coming together to change it. And so whether it's here in Rochester or whether it's in New York City or DC or whether it's anywhere, it is people of goodwill who are bound and determined that we are not going to capitulate to evil and we're gonna change it. And those are the people who actually do. If you cannot preach like Peter and you cannot pray like Paul, Oh, you just tell the love of Jesus, how he died to save us all. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded fall. As you prepare to march, meditate on the life and the teachings of Jesus. There are some people that when they even think of overturning this, these, these three things, mm -hmm. violence, poverty, and racism, um, they see it as an impossibility. Because it's hard. It is hard. And that being said, it what, it, what would be your message to, to people tuning in um, and to our community here in Rochester in terms of just some practical steps, some things that all of us can do mm -hmm. in terms of helping to make that change? Well, I think the one thing is um, none of us can do it alone. We've got to do it in organizations and community. And so community organizations and groups, ecumenical, interfaith, um, when, when I was, I'll give you an example, when I was a priest in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, we were dealing with then, and, and, and Baltimore's still struggling with it, but we were dealing then with escalating levels of violence um, in the center city. I was uh, a priest at a parish, center city, Baltimore, um, I mean, that was the city that gave us that TV show, Homicide, and remember The Wire? I sure do. Uh, there were oh, episodes yes. of The Wire that were filmed at the church where I was the priest. Um, they used the tower for that. Um, but we were dealing with some escalating, this is in the late 80s, early 90s, escalating levels of violence. And um, it was the first time in my ministry where a group of us came together ecumenically, and I had done that before but where we came together in some interfaith, um, both Christians and Muslims in that particular area. Um, because while we disagreed about a number of matters of theology, we did agree that we wanted safe neighborhoods. And, and we found a way to make a witness and to be involved in activities by coming together and organizing together to engage one particular issue, the level of violence in our communities. If we could make this particular area, this neighborhood safe and secure, that's an accomplishment. 
Uh, Jesus once said to somebody who was like trying to do everything, I think there's a story of Mary and Martha in the Bible, um, and they're trying to do everything, and, and Jesus just said, one thing is needful. Sometimes you have to, then one of the teachings I learned from community organizing is that you have to have an, one agenda item, and you identify what that priority is, organize around it, and then move on it, and accomplish that, then you move to the next thing. Poverty, racism, and violence, that's big. Start one child at a time. Start one school at a time. Start one neighborhood at a time. People in that neighborhood come together, bring the churches, bring the mosque, bring the synagogues, bring the, the Greek society, Br bring everybody together. Because if we can find that one thing that we agree that we've got to change, then organize to change that. And so, it's kind of hard to conquer a mountain, but you can take control of a pebble. The Most Reverend Michael Curry. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and God bless you. Well, this has certainly been a roller coaster ride of an election year, and one that will, without a doubt, go down in history. Locally, Congresswoman Louise Slaughter held on to her seat in the 25th Congressional District, and she is now preparing for her 16th term. Another big win in one of the most watched local races is Adam Bello from Monroe County Clerk. I'm joined right now by Randy Gorman, WXXI's Director of News and Public Affairs, for a quick look back at the election that was. Welcome, Randy. Thank you very much. Well, change is this common theme, right, that we often mm -hmm. hear during elections and with political campaigns. Is this national cry, call for change, that we're hearing about more and more after the election of Donald Trump, something that we will likely see locally, considering the reactions, or the results, rather, that we've had in our local elections? You know, Helen, at least not in terms of the local candidates and the statewide candidates. Uh, you look across the state, all of the congressional incumbents won. In our area, there had been thoughts that there would be some closer races, especially the Slaughter Senior race. Uh, he came within 900 votes of, of beating her last time. Uh, this time, she uh, she won by about 11 percentage points or so. Uh, and in terms of all the state incumbents, uh, state legislative uh, incumbents, most of them all won re-election. Uh, here in Monroe County, which is more Democratic uh, than Republican in terms of party registration, uh, that probably benefited uh, Louise Slaughter, obviously. Uh, Adam Bellow, who was appointed as county right. clerk earlier this year, uh, he won uh, quite easily over his Republican challenger. Uh, so if there are any coattail effects from Donald Trump, we didn't really see it locally. Interesting. So in terms of these local election results that you, that you touched upon, which, if any, do you think will have the biggest impact on our region moving forward? I think if you look at the uh, county clerk race, now the county clerk uh, isn't, uh, so to speak, a sexy position, although <laughs> Bill has been more active. Yeah. You know, what do they do? They, they move papers around, they run the DMV. <laughs> but uh, actually, he's been a bit more active this year with that, talking about zombie properties, uh, some other issues. But more importantly is the political uh, overtones with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Bello is looked at as a rising star in the uh, Democratic Party. It's been about 25 years since Monroe County has had a Democratic county executive. A a lot of people are touting, at least on the Democratic side, touting Adam Bellow as someone who could maybe be the uh, the first Democratic county executive when that election comes up in four years from now. So I think really it will be interesting to see how he uses that county clerk race as a stepping stone, which after all is what Cheryl Denolfo did when she That's moved right. from clerk to become a Republican county executive. Right. As we wrap up. One thing that we've heard a lot about uh, is this trying to bridge this divide that we've had uh, nationally and locally. Are we hearing from any of our local elected officials in terms of what that might look like here moving forward? It's a good question. Mark Cassini, who lost, was, was pretty gracious uh, in, in defeat, uh, but talked about the need for the Republican Party to kind of more or less come to grips uh, with how they are going to be unified going forward. We're not hearing about a lot of uh, cooperation between uh, Republican and Democrats here, but we often don't in terms of a, a hot political year. Uh, what's going to happen, I think, is going to be interesting interesting is the impact on, uh, on local and state uh, funding after uh, the Trump presidency really takes hold. All right. All right. With, well, with the election just barely in our rearview mirrors, we hit the street to capture the reactions of area residents of all backgrounds and political leanings. How are they feeling about the results of this year's presidential election as businessman Donald Trump wins the seat of commander in chief over former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton? Check it out. Well, since I was up all night <laughs> watching TV to see who was winning um, on the edge of my couch, I'm exhausted, but I'm very excited that Trump won. I think he's going to do a lot of things. He's going to actually make a great America again. Um, he's going to make change. He's intelligent. He's powerful. People listen to him. He can be a little crazy at times, but I think that he could really put America back where it belongs. A little bitter. I felt that he should have became president. He couldn't manage his own money, let alone 
our country. He's irresponsible. There's a lot, but I guess we got to stick with him for the next four years. I'm feeling good because that's what the people wanted. That's who they wanted to vote for, so people always win. What do you think is next for us? Well, I just hope he do some of the stuff that he said he was going to do, you know, like maybe control the borders and, you know, the immigration and stuff like that. I'm very disappointed. I feel the man that we have elected is uh, has no diplomacy in his body and that he uh, degrades and belittles everyone that he meets along the way. I don't believe that's the kind of character. And everyone says, well, this man is not a politician, but we're putting him in the, one of the most major offices in the world without experience. I'm very concerned. I'm feeling uh, like Washington needs a change because there's been so much insider uh, manipulation of the system and the process, and Mr. Trump has outsmarted the media again. I'm sorry. I have mixed feelings about it because I really did not want Donald Trump to win the election. Um, I was really hoping that Hillary would have won because it would have made, it would have been a better outcome for New Yorkers and for all Americans. And seeing that Donald Trump won, um, I don't know how it's going to play out. I just hope that it'll be well, that he'll lead the country the way it should be led, but I don't know because it was a game to him when he first started with the election. Um, so I don't know. I'm feeling very, very hopeful for the country. I'm um, hoping that uh, President Trump can bring people together because that that's what we really need to do. We've got too much division and we just need to come together and work to make America great again. All of your election 2016 coverage, results and analysis is up on our website. Just go to WXXINews.org. Well, the Rochester City Ballet is one of a few dance companies around the country offering special performances for kids with autism or other disabilities with sensory sensitivities. As we'll learn in this Arts and Focus story, this step has created more inclusive opportunities for area kids. Take a look. Everyone at Rochester City Ballet loves ballet and the performing arts. We want to share it with everyone, and that's why we decided to do the Sensory Friendly Show. Children on the autism spectrum respond to stimuli differently and it may be very difficult for them to sit in the dark. So one of the first things we do with a sensory friendly show is keep the lights on halfway. We also will take out very loud sounds that might disrupt someone. When a child with autism hears a loud sound or sees a strobe light or flashing lights, they can feel very, very uncomfortable and we want to make everyone have a great time at our show. Delvey Duckman is about, I guess, finding your place in society and how, how we develop and how we fit into certain situations. As for the sensory friendly audience, I think it's, it's very relevant for them as well. Just because, you know, the ugly duckling, it, it's, you know, she's born in a nest of ducks and it's not her fault. She's born into a place where she has normal, she thinks she has normal siblings, but they look different than her, you know. Uh, she sounds different than they do and therefore she's kind of put on the outskirts of things. Um, but they don't know why they're doing it to her. That's the a, that's a, that's a thing about it. You know, they, they have no reason other than the way she looks and the way she sounds. And that's the message is they're not given time for growth or time for development to see who she really is and, and understanding. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a huge message in there for everybody, for kids, children and adults. The Ugly Duckling. I mean, it, it's a perfect show. You know, she spent the whole time wanting to be included. And that's no different for, for any other human being um, out there, whether you have challenges or whether you have differences or not. It's a show that was what they call sensory friendly. So for kids that struggle with loud noises and lighting and needing you know, some fidget time or fidget room, it's a really nice place to be able to come and just watch a show, a good show, 
and not have to worry about some of the other extra things that you normally would, you know, when, you, when you're going to a show. I think it's a wonderful performance, a sensory-friendly performance. It allows children that wouldn't normally come to the theater to see a live performance just because of, of their disability and, and what bothers them about the stage. I think it just gives the families an opportunity to come out and feel comfortable in, in, in a theater in a setting like that. We call it the performance where no one says shush. And families know that they can come and if their child has a narrative throughout the entire show, that's fine. These are the kind of places that families can come out to and not have to worry about Oh my gosh, is that, you know, the folks in, in the next row are they gonna, is my child gonna be too loud or is they gonna be too fidgety? Here, you don't have to worry about that. A venue like this is, it's an enjoyment for the whole family because the whole family gets to just let loose. When, you know, when you're a parent of a special needs child, the stress that a parent feels just in preparing to go is tremendous. There's always gotta be an out. Here, you don't have to worry about that. It's just, it's so awesome that I, I would love to see this kind of stuff expand. As performers, we're gratified by the impact that we have on, on the audience, especially on children. The, the production lives with them for months after they see it. They still want to relive it. I'm really happy about bringing that to their, into their lives, you know, and you never know what's gonna, what's gonna touch a, 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 a youngster in the audience and what, what's gonna spark their intrigue and, and get them going into a direction that they normally wouldn't go into. We love the magic of ballet and dance and how it inspires us and makes us happy. We wanna share that with everybody. Green Eggs and Ham, a personal Dr. Seuss favorite, is the next upcoming sensory-friendly performance by the Rochester City Ballet. To learn more and to get free tickets, go to rochestercityballet.com. This story was brought to us by WXXI's Arts and Focus program. To learn more about upcoming broadcasts or to check out previous stories, go to artsandfocus.tv. And that wraps up this edition of Need to Know, Rochester's news magazine. I'm your host, Len B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for watching our program tonight. And for those of you who tune in during the weekend or online, thank you for joining us. I'll see you next Thursday night right here on WXXI-TV.